Hey, everybody. It's the Jimmy Dore Show. I'm Aaron Maté sitting in for Jimmy uh, and here with Misha Pollan, who's sitting in for Steph. Hey, Misha. Hey, hey, Aaron. How's it going? It's going. It's a great thing we started a little late because right before we went to air, I had a massive sneeze attack. And <laughs> if we'd started that way, it would have been horrible. It would have been a terrible way to kick off this show. But uh, we're here now and we're very excited to be joined by our first guest. Anya Parmpil is my colleague at The Gray Zone. <laughs> Uh, she has reported and produced uh, for uh, several documentaries, including on the ground reports from the Korean Peninsula, Palestine, Venezuela, and Honduras. Her forthcoming book, Corporate Coup, is available now for pre order. Anya, how you doing? It's good to see you. Good to see you too, Aaron. And uh, I can definitely say that the sneeze attack was real. It happened. <laughs> I heard it all. The sneeze attack was real. <laughs> All right. Well, so let's get into it. So um, remember back when um, Trump was the president and he tried to install a new president of Venezuela. This is what he said. Remember this? Here this evening, a very brave man who carries with him the hopes, dreams and aspirations of all Venezuelans. Joining us in the gallery is the true and legitimate president of Venezuela, Juan Guaido. Mr. President... Please take this message back to your So there you have it, the standing ovation for Juan Guaido, who Trump was trying to install as the new president of Venezuela. This was back in 2019, and this set off this prolonged coup campaign where the U.S. imposed these harsh sanctions that aimed to destroy Venezuela's economy until basically the people suffered enough so that they would turn against uh, their actual president, Nicolas Maduro, and overthrow him and install this U.S.-backed puppet, Juan Guaido. And so the U.S. tried very hard to make this happen. This is back uh, from 2021. Biden, and when Biden came in, he continued the Trump policy. This is the headline from Reuters. Biden will recognize Guaido as Venezuela's leader. As we saw from that clip, Nancy Pelosi was joining Trump and giving Guaido a standing ovation. So this was very bipartisan. Uh, but then the Ukraine proxy war happened and things started to change. So this is a headline from March 2022. White House reaches out to Venezuela, a longtime foe amid Russia crisis. Because guess what? The U.S. tried to cut off Russian oil from the rest of the world, leaving them empty handed when their allies needed energy. And after years of trying to overthrow Nicolas Maduro, U.S. had imposed sanctions that had left Venezuela's oil industry uh, in a very, in very, very rough shape. So now all of a sudden, the Ukraine crisis changed that. And uh, then we had, uh, in June 2022, we had this. There was a Summit of the Americas held by, hosted by the U.S. here in Los Angeles. But guess what? Biden extends support, but not some invitation to Venezuela's Guaido, the same guy who Biden was pretending was the president of Venezuela. Uh, and it got to the point where you, we saw in that clip earlier that Nancy Pelosi who had uh, applauded Juan Guaido and gave him a standing ovation in Congress, now she doesn't even remember who, who he is. Yeah. So someone's asking, I have a question about Venezuela. Migrants. But yeah. the person that you recognize as uh, the leader, democratic leader in Venezuela is not here. What do you think about the absence of Juan Guaido here? By whom? Juan Guaido. The, the interim president of Venezuela that you recognize. Well, I want to talk about who is here. Who is here as the president of the United States and has been said four years ago the president did not attend. Who is here? So that's Nancy Pelosi. Who? Who? Who is that guy? The same guy that she gave a standing ovation to and claimed was the president of Venezuela. She leapt out of her seat. Leapt out of her seat. Oh, yes. You beat Mike Pence. <laughs> um. But moving ahead, uh, you know, moving ahead to the, the present day, uh, check out what just happened. Juan Guaido is voted out as leader of Venezuela's opposition. 
This is from the New York Times. The opposition legislature in Venezuela voted on Friday to, to terminate its interim government, ending the leadership of Juan Guaido, who for years had served as the face of resistance to the country's authoritarian government. The vote was a blow to the U.S., which had steadfastly backed Mr. Guaido. It was the second and final vote this month to determine the fate of the interim government, whose influence has waned in recent years as President Nicolas Maduro has held on to power. Mr. Guaido failed to cement his popular support and the opposition fractured. Let me bring in Anya Parampil. Anya, you've been covering this story for a long time now. You've been on the ground in Venezuela several times, and it's the topic of your forthcoming book called The Corporate Coup. What happened here? What happened to Juan Guaido, and why is he now uh, on the outs? There are so many layers to this story, and Venezuelans would say it's entirely Venezuelan because there, and you can't get it out of reading necessarily the mainstream media reports. You get a, some allusion to what actually took place because one important fact to highlight that isn't really made in many of the, or prominent in many of these mainstream reports is that this National Assembly is completely defunct. Not only has the legislature was the 2015 legislature in, in declared uh, defunct by the country's Supreme Court due to allegations of fraud that were never resolved. That That's a history that I get into into my book. But this vote took place, and they, they'll never say this in the New York Times, I don't think they did, uh, from what I remember reading the article, that this vote took place on Zoom, first of all, because they don't even... They haven't been meeting as the National Assembly in the halls of the National Assembly since uh, since 2020, when, in fact, Guaido was already voted out by the Venezuelan opposition, much of the Venezuelan opposition as president of the National Assembly. In fact, so he came, he was elected in uh, tw- he, his term began in 2019 as president of the National Assembly, which, again, was already declared defunct by the state, but they were operating without major uh, impairment from from Venezuelan authorities. So they still met, carried out their duties and so far as they could. And Guaido announces his self-declared presidency. We get a year of an obvious failed attempt at regime change. And so by 2020, by January 2020, when his first term constitutionally only got one year term as president of the National Assembly was up, Venezuela's opposition much of it actually voted to replace him already. Uh, you might remember that video actually that keeps popping up on screen, I believe, was when Guaido was being, he was trying to enter the National Assembly for the vote with uh, some of these legislators who were declared in comunicado. And through that, they remember the iconic photo of him trying to climb over the fence and get in and everybody's like, oh, Juan Guaido was blocked from entering the National Assembly. It was really a staged photo op for him to make it seem as though he'd been denied entry because what was happening inside was that the opposition legislature uh, legislators were voting for Luis Pata, a separate candidate to actually represent the opposition and lead the lead the National Assembly as, as president. So Guaido at that point was already voted out. And that same night, Guaido's allies decided to band together and go down the street to uh, one of the national newspapers, right-wing opposite pro-opposition national newspapers in Venezuela, and hold a shadow vote where they created a shadow national assembly, which wasn't even based on the main members of the national assembly. In, in Venezuela, they have actually alternate candidates, like kind of a shadow representative who comes in to vote if the main representative can't carry out their duties. And in order to save Guaido, some of these shadow representatives got together and had a separate election where they appointed him head of their imaginary, imaginary National Assembly. So there have already been so many layers to this where Guaido was clearly his 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 legitimacy within the opposition was so it had already been called into question and pretty much he'd lost that vote right. uh, in quite clear terms. But now what we're seeing is the four remaining parties there there are the they're they're called the G4 they're the block of the opposition within Venezuela that is the most radical and has the closest relationship with the United States I will I get into those details in my book explaining particularly so you're talking about uh, Voluntad Popular Juan Guaido's party Un Nuevo Tiempo Acción Democrática and Primero Justicia these are the three or the four 
parties that make up the most radical op- wing of the opposition block. Some people, I was speaking to one friend who joked, this group doesn't even so much as breathe without consulting the United States. They are the group that is so radical, they even denied themselves the own their own right to participate in the last elections for the legislature in, in 2020, which I, I, I observed that vote. I was there in Venezuela at the time. These four parties didn't allow their candidates to participate in the election because, well, they claim because they don't believe that it's a free and fair system. But I would argue they do it because the United States and this group wants to delegitimize the system and say that, look, we are not allowed to participate and and uh, our lack of participation is proof that that this is a dictatorship. And they went so far as even they would smear members of the opposition, people who hate Chavez, people who hate Maduro, who ran for office. They smear them as agents of the government. In fact, the United States sanctioned Luis Parra for particip- for, for ch- having challenged Juan Guaido's legitimacy within yeah. the opposition of the National Assembly. So that's what we're seeing now is that this extreme bloc has decided for whatever reason that Guaido is a project they can no longer support. Guaido's party is pretty upset about this, but I still think it only represents a change in strategy from the part of the U.S. and then the opposition bloc that it controls. Well, let's show that video. This is uh, Juan Guaido. And this was a pretty common occurrence where he would show up at these public events and then people would assault him. Oh. <laughs> So that's fake President Guaido being greeted by some of his uh, constituents yeah. who aren't happy with it. I, I but, would think but, of a different video. Yeah, yeah but, but talk to us about I mean, what his actions, that of him and his clique, meant for the people of Venezuela. The money and the resources, like the Venezuelan resources that they were basically stole, that, that basically the U.S. stole on their behalf. And what the impact was on their country, uh, what the impact was of these sanctions that Guaido cheered on. Well, the most obvious effect of the sanction, the, the barring of, there were multiple, the U.S. had already really, with the under Obama, by declaring Venezuela to be a national security threat, that led to a huge rate, a jump in rates of shipping to Venezuela. It created a crisis of import, export, uh, because companies simply didn't want to do Venez- uh, business with Venezuela. And because they see it costs too much and there's a risk if the United States is saying that Venezuela is a national security threat, maybe there's going to be a war. So really the humanitarian crisis was at its height in 2015, 2016, 2017. There was a lot of street violence. There was a lot of, there were multiple uh, Guarimba moments. Uh, Those are like the, the riots that took place that were, Framed as opposition protests, but really, I mean, they were just, they would set up blockades in the street all around the country. They, they prevented uh, basic goods from getting around and they were, they were, that, that was all a result of the, the humanitarian crisis that came from the sanctions. And then also the U.S. was funding a lot of these student groups. Again, things that I explained in the book, but that was, I think, the height of uh, the humanitarian crisis and the political crisis in uh, Venezuela that came along with it. The problem is, from the perspective of U.S. policy, where they, if their goal was regime change, by introducing Guaido to the picture in, in January of 2019, they were, pu- they were declaring a fait accompli before the actual regime change had taken place. So it actually pulled any momentum out mm. from the opposition it, that they did have in the streets at that time. Because if the point is regime change, well... If you're now declaring that the, the regime change has already taken place, then the opposition it really lost a lot of its 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 energy in the streets because, from their perspective, well, yeah, Juan Guaido is already president. But so it was it, in terms of like achieving the physical regime change on the ground in Caracas, and also in terms of having a legitimate political opposition, I think Juan Guaido was actually the worst thing that ever happened to the Venezuelan opposition. I described him, I gave a comment, I think it was to Sputnik News, is saying that he was essentially, a, I, and I'm just observing, even if you are 
pro opposition. He's like a tapeworm. He really poisoned them because he took away any, not only does he attack and hit his group, do they attack any other blocks within the opposition who oppose sanctions or who want to participate in the democratic process? And that has been more damaging to the Venezuelan opposition than anything I think the Maduro government could have done to uh, mm. delegitimize the opposition. And so, and what about the pl- what, they, what about the plunder of the resources, like the the yes, seizing of the uh, uh, of Venezuelan state assets and giving them over to Guaido's cronies? This is the key, and that's why I called my book "Corporate Coup." That explanation I was giving you was to lead up to the point that maybe physical regime change on the ground in Caracas. Perhaps there were some in the Venezuelan opposition and in the U.S. administration who thought uh, appointing Juan Guaido was the best way to achieve that. But in reality, I think there were also others who said maybe that's never going to happen. The best thing that we can do if we recognize this shadow parallel government is now we have the pretext to in London, for example, the Bank of England froze three billion, maybe four billion dollars worth of Venezuelan gold assets, which, by the way, we're talking about gold, not cash, like literal just gold assets that the Venezuelans were storing there. Uh, President Maduro had begun the process of attempting to repatriate that gold in the fall of 2018. So just months before the United States recognized Juan Guaido as president, Maduro was attempting to bring that money, bring that gold back to Venezuela. So this recognition of Guaido was the perfect cover to say, okay, we uh, cannot figure out actually where this gold should go. We don't know who's president of Venezuela. So it just has to stay indefinitely in the vaults of the Bank of England while we try to decide in the courts where we actually would send this gold. Of course, there's no question who controls the Central Bank of Venezuela. Guaido never had any control of any institution there. You could very easily. Well, he did have an office. He did have an office in some building, right? With like a, a Venezuelan flag on the wall. That's, it might that's, have been that's out what he of controlled. The, <laughs> no one's quite sure where it was. And there were some points that I think he was living inside the French embassy mm. after his failed uh, military when he actually tried to incite a military rebellion. So yeah. he had this little set, I think, that he dragged around that basically like you could put a flag right there where you're sitting here and you could say like, I'm the president of Venezuela. Yeah. But um, and then in the United States, not only do you have assets stored in Venezuelan bank accounts. Uh, that were frozen and turned over to the interim government, basically meaning that the United States has uh, its hands on those assets now, and it stays in the banks, the the U.S. banks, and can it never it can never be taken out and you know sent to Russian Chinese bank as Venezuela is actually working towards uh, building a multipolar world where they're not sh- storing their assets in the West anymore. That's a huge threat to the transatlantic establishment that that, that you know we know is so the heart of the empire. And so, but the the largest internationally stored asset uh, belonging to the Venezuelan government is Sitco Petroleum, which is, it is a subsidiary of uh, PDVSA, the Venezuelan state oil company. And Sitco, uh, for Americans, it's a gas station, but it's actually a lot more. If you take the train from New York to DC or vice versa, you can actually see huge uh, oil uh, uh, Sitco's, um, and I'm just totally losing the word right now, but where they actually store the oil in the refinery. uh, refineries, yeah. it's refineries, it's oil pipelines. It's a whole network that comes out of, that is part of Sitco. It's not just gas stations. And so it's even hard to value uh, how much the, but it's billion. It's over the, the value of what's in the bank of England uh, in, in the, in the gold assets. And so that. Not only were those assets frozen and turned over to to the opposition interim government, but as I really explain in my book, every the the main characters involved with Guaido's shadow government, his U.S. based representatives, and I'm talking particularly about his ambassador, his representative here, Carlos Vecchio, and his former Attorney General uh, Jose Ignacio Hernandez. Carlos Vecchio himself was a former uh, functionary of the foreign control of the foreign oil industry in Venezuela before the revolution. 
even during and after the revolution, as Chavez came and was restructuring the industry, Carlos Vecchio was a top lawyer for ExxonMobil while it was battling the socialization process of uh, Venezuela's uh, oil reserves. And when they lost that fight, that's when ultimately Carlos Vecchio turned to politics and ended up coming to the United States. And so that's the interest that someone like Vecchio represents. And then working in tandem with Jose Ignacio Hernandez, the attorney general is what we can call him in, in the U.S. sense, they actually oversaw a legal process that now has resulted in Citgo is on the verge of complete liquidation. And it's a, it's a complicated case. We don't necessarily have to get into the details now. But what I would just explain is that there, there are uh, several companies that were suing Venezuela's government for, for example, uh, in this case, Crystal X was the most main one that people may have heard or people were talking about quite a bit in 2019. It's a company, a gold a mining company that had a gold mine in Venezuela, that they, they had the rights to it. And Venezuela's government decided they didn't want to actually give it up. They were going to nationalize it and, and mine it themselves. So Crystal X turns to the international courts, uh, U.S. and U.S. Uh, U.S. courts to say that they... Uh, are owed a debt. They, Venezuela's government owes them money because because of this mine. And the only way that they had to collect on that debt once they, the arbitration court, the International Arbitration Court, which is a, a part of the World Bank, ruled in its favor was to turn and look at the assets that are in the United States. Because Venezuela's government, you can't force them to pay up this money to the company. But if there's Venezuelan assets in the United States that this company can now come to a U.S. court and say, hey, the World Bank says that I'm owed this money by Venezuela. Can we go after some part of Citgo to get that money back? And that's what happened. That's how the they took it over, yeah. They took it over, but it was all through the work of Guaido's attorney general, Jose Ignacio Hernandez, who was wow. actually working for that company, Crystalex, but multiple companies that were suing Venezuela's government and asking for money back. And as a result of his failure to protect those assets, and he made very specific movements that showed even when he was claiming to represent Venezuela interest as on behalf of the interim government in U.S. courts, he was still making decisions that benefited Crystal X and these other corporations that had previously paid him as an expert witness in their cases against the Venezuelan government. And now Sitgo, it's going through this long drawn out legal process where one day a judge will just auction off much of Sitgo's assets and it will end up in the pockets of these transnational corporations that employed the very people that Guaido claims are his representatives here in the United States. Hence why your book is called The Corporate Coup. And, you know, going back to that line I read from the New York Times where, they, you know, and this is how the Venezuelan government is always described. It's always described as an authoritarian government, uh, at least if you read, you know, state media here in, in the U.S., like the New York Times. But, you know, just thinking about what you're describing, like the plunder of a country's assets, like trying to install a puppet president who was selected not by the Venezuelan people, but by, you know, uh, Donald Trump and Mike Pompeo and John Bolton. There's nothing more authoritarian than what the U.S. tried to do to Venezuela. But yet yeah. the U.S. constantly accuses of Venezuela of being authoritarian. N nobody in Venezuela voted for any of these policies. And, and accordingly, they've suffered the impact. And just to um, – as we wrap up, this is John Bolton speaking uh, last year on CNN where he bragged about his role in organizing the coup in Venezuela. And he did so in the context of speaking about January 6th, which he pointed out uh, wasn't a coup attempt, at least of the kind that he's used to organizing. I, know that I agree with you, to be, to be uh, fair, with all due respect, uh, one doesn't have to be brilliant to attempt a coup. Uh, I disagree with that. As somebody who has helped plan coup d'etat, yeah. not here, but you know, other places, uh, it takes a lot of work. And that's not what he did. I, I do want to ask a follow-up um, when we were talking about what is capable, what you need to do to be able to plan a coup, and you you cited your expertise having planned coups. I'm not going to get into the specifics, but uh, successful coups. Well, I wrote about Venezuela in uh, in the book, and uh, it it turned out not to be successful. Not that we had all that much to do with it, but I saw what it took. <laughs> so you know, Anya, I was curious your thoughts on that. Bolton's claiming he, we didn't have very much to uh, do with the coup in Venezuela. He's trying to actually, he's taking credit for it, but also distancing himself from it. So your comments on that and any final words for us as we wrap, uh, and any parting words for fake President Guaido? 
he's pretty much not really worth acknowledging in some <laughs> ways, which is like, for example, I mean, you were saying that, and I'll, I'll get back to Bolton in a minute, but you were saying that they always claim Venezuela's government is authoritarian, and yet everything we've described, and even more of what we haven't described, what the opposition has done in Venezuela, you could never get away with. I mean, they put the QAnon shaman to shame in terms of the violence and the the level of actual treasonous activity that took, I mean, they were calling, he was running around trying to set up a parallel government. If you tried to do that in the United States, I don't think you'd be running around on the streets uh, the way Juan Guaido has been all these years. And I even put that question to the former foreign minister, Jorge Ariasa, during an interview that was published on the Gray Zone. Why, why did the government make that decision? And it is tricky because I've heard people challenging them and saying, hey, we have rules, we have laws, Juan Guaido's running around breaking them, why isn't he in jail? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a political calculation. I think they realized he was so ineffectual that in some ways arresting him would have given the U.S. what he want, they wanted. It would have turned him into a martyr and actually made it look like the government was a dictatorship, which is what the U.S. wants which is how the U.S. wants it to appear. As for Bolton, I mean, I read his book to do, in order to do mine. I read all of the memoirs that came out of the Trump administration concerning Venez uh, on Venezuela policy. And he makes it very clear that he was the main architect of this policy in his book. I mean, he was agitating across the board. In fact, there's one interesting part that I think now people would find especially significant where Bolton writes about lobbying Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin to go for these extreme sanctions, which were banning the sale of Venezuelan oil in U.S. markets, uh, because Mnuchin was uncomfortable with that. He said it could lead to high oil prices. And in the future, if there was an unstable oil market, it would hurt the United States to actually be not allowed. Like, why would you ban yourself from buying something? Like, they can go sell their oil to India or to Russia, which is what they did. But that just means that we don't get the oil. And, and interestingly enough, Russian oil came and filled the exact void in the market. Like when we lost all of our Venezuelan oil, Russia came and sold. And then we banned ourselves. We banned the sale <laughs> of Russian oil, too. So, yeah. I mean, it's like our leaders are shooting themselves in the foot. That That's another main thesis of my book. And that it's forcing the rest of the world, Russia, China, Iran, Turkey, Venezuela, to form an alternative block to say, look, we are done with the London, Brussels, New York axis, particularly not just when it comes to politics, but in terms of the financial world and the financial system. And so, yeah, it, that is that that's something else that I focus on in the book, because it's it's something that I think you and I are going to be seeing come to life in the next few years, something that we've never experienced uh, as the historic West, that there's an alternative to our like monopoly on the global financial network. Well, Juan Guaido, I think we'll have time to read more on this from his exile in, in Miami, where, which is where I expect him to go. I don't know. Any predictions for where he's hey, going to end up? I mean, I don't know. Leopoldo Lopez is in Spain. Yeah. Miami. I guess I might choose Miami over, over Madrid. But I don't Bolsonaro know. just got there. So, you know, uh, maybe Juan Guaido can join him. Uh, Anya Parampel, journalist with The Gray Zone, her book on the – Crisis in Venezuela, the attempted and failed U.S. coup there is called Corporate Coup. It's available now for pre-order. Anya, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Aaron. Everybody, we're doing live stand-up comedy in Los Angeles in January and February in Los Angeles. And then we're going to Tempe, Palm Springs, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Nashville. Go to JimmyDoor.com for a link for all those tickets to become a premium member while you're there.